Are you in pain? No. Were you ever in pain? Yes. How many years ago? Um, well, wow, now that I'm thinking about this, my earliest memory was being in pain. Really? Yeah. Um, I guess I was, I mean, my earliest memory was probably three and a half, and I actually couldn't breathe because I was allergic to milk, and I had massive congestion from it. They actually took my tonsils out. But that was my first memory. Interesting, right? I, I didn't yes. think of that before. Yeah. Um, but then when I was um, in my uh, late teens, early 20s, I had very bad upper back pain between the shoulder blade pain. And um, it was pretty incessant. And uh, it was probably what drove me to going to massage school. Really? To heal yourself? Mm -hmm. um, well, it was because I, I finished college and I actually had a car accident and I went to a chiropractor and I said to him, um, you know, I would, I would become a chiropractor, but I don't want to go through all that schooling. And I actually had been massaging people since I was four years old. It was just a natural thing for me. And he suggested to go to massage school. And it was, it was because I had a natural propensity, but I was also really curious if I could get rid of my own pain. And it was great because, you know, we had to practice on each other. So I got a lot of massage, um, which wasn't the whole answer, but it was, a, it was a, the beginning. And... Um, I had that pain on and off for probably a decade. And, um, but then I've had other accidents. I've had head injuries. I've had foot injuries. I've broken things. So I've had more pain than you even want to know <laughs> at various times. Now, why did you choose a chiropractor and instead of a doctor after your accident? Um, well, actually, um, when I was a kid, I grew up in Woodstock, so you're already having an alternative attitude. Um, but I guess when I was maybe seven or eight, I twisted my neck really bad. So there's another pain moment. And my mother took me to a doctor, the you know local doctor, and he uh, prescribed muscle relaxants. And my mother had just read an article about muscle relaxants, how they never leave your body. And she went, wait a second, my kid is seven years old or eight years old. And so there was this chiropractor, Audrey Hamilton in Woodstock. She was, she's kind of a legend and she was this sweet, I can still see her in my mind, little bit bosomy, soft. And she did a chiropractic adjustment that like she went through your whole body. She like adjusted your ankles and your wrists and your elbows and everything. And my mother took me there and I could move my neck. Wow, but you know that, that when somebody has that neck thing and they can't move and there's like, a, it's, you know, she fixed me. Um, and I think I went back like two or three times or something. So, so, so that age was- So eight, you understood that there was- I didn't no. understand, my mother understood. <laughs> that medication wasn't the only option. Right. My mother understood that I was, you know, just going along with whatever it was. And, and of course, it felt great yeah. for her to kindly touch me and feel. Uh, recently, I broke my arm. Uh, three years ago, I broke my arm, I, which is crazy for a massage therapist to break her arm. Um, but I actually had a terrible experience. The the doctor who casted my arm put it on too tight and two days later I had to go to the emergency room and get it cut off. What I noticed was that he didn't ever touch my arm. So he didn't really know when he was wrapping it how my arm was going to respond to that wrapping. You know how easy it is to put an ace bandage on too tight? Yes, the doctor didn't. This is an orthopedist. He didn't touch me. So here I was as a child, and this woman is touching me, and it was incredibly healing. And my, I come from a family of touchers, so it was a natural instinct, and 
Then when I go to a massage school, I find out that there's the people have been studying for 5,000 years touching, you know, massage, but it's touching. And so... Healing hands, right? Right. Healing touch. Yes. 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 And, you know, and I ha can tell you all sorts of stories about why that, I mean, I have, I've come to really understand why that works now. So that's very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that, I mean, you I'm answering your question about... So you're in no pain now with all the injuries you've gone through. Do you think massage was the answer? Did you choose any other alternatives? The, uh, um, well, I've had acupuncture. Mm -hmm. um, I think diet is extremely important. I think lifestyle is important. I think sleeping is important. I know it's the answer. I, I think um, when my clients come to me, I am often the answer. Sometimes I'm part of the answer. Sometimes I am the person who leads them to their answer. And sometimes I'm not their answer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, healing is a process of finding your answer and not taking, any, not taking anybody else's negativity about your pain, number one, because I think that's huge. You know, the incurable, like there's, my sister had a, had a terrible situation happen, and they basically told her it was incurable. And it's like, Tell no. Tell me about that a little bit. Um, she had an ovarian cyst. They operated. They must have um, damaged her sciatic nerve. Her leg swelled up, big red. It wasn't her imagination that her leg hurt. You could see it was swollen. And... I can't remember what they called it, but um, it was a neurological problem um, that caused this intense pain and swelling. And she was in pain for a good solid seven years. And she, and she had a lawsuit and she lost it because they couldn't prove that it was negligence on the doctor's part, even though they, it was clear it happened during the surgery. And she had to spend all that time proving that she was incurable. And when she lost, she called me up and I was so angry that she would lose. She said, it's okay. Now I don't have to prove that I'm incurable anymore. Now I can really focus on healing. And she did acupuncture, which was something she was frightened, really frightened to do, and water therapy. And um, that was a long time ago now. And I don't know if she has any pain at all, but I don't think it's much. So she recovered, she water skis, she dances, she is fine. But it took her, and I said to her, you know, uh, seven years is, when you have something serious like that, that's, you might have to go seven years, because it takes seven years for all of your cells in your body to regenerate. So there's not a cell left in your body from seven years ago. They've all been replaced. Now there's, there's evidence that there's not an atom left in your body from a year ago. We're just exchanging our matter with what we ate, what we drank, what we breathed. So that's, so since we're regenerating, we're not like a car, we break down, you have to get fixed from the outside. No, we're regenerating all the time. So the, the capacity for healing is constant. Do you think people have to take, like your sister and yourself, their own initiative um, for healing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't, yes. I don't see another way to do it. People have to take their own initiative. Sometimes you're lucky and you land in the right place. But if you don't think you're part of the process of your own healing, and you think somebody else is going to do it for you, you're putting yourself in a bad position. You have to take your own initiative. If you think that someone else is going to fix you, you're, you're putting yourself in a, in a bad position. And I have people come in, and they do want me to fix them. And I say, I don't fix people. What I do is I help them feel themselves. So most of the time when somebody's in pain, they've, they've disconnected 
they, they don't like how they feel. They're hurt, so they disconnect from their hurt, but their hurt is part of their body. Their body is hurting, their body is saying something is wrong, and it's, and it's basically kill the messenger. I don't want to hurt. How do I get rid of the hurt? So the way to get rid of the hurt is to heal. Healing takes place from within, and, and um, if you're in pain, it means something's wrong and you need to heal. You don't want to just get rid of the pain. The pain is the message that something's wrong, and so the pain is the messenger. And when I work with people, yeah, I want to help. I, I do want to help bring them some relief just enough relief so that they can listen to the pain. If you don't hear what the pain is telling you, you don't know what to do. You don't, you don't have a direction. So if you, just, if you just gag that pain, stifle it, then you've lost, you've lost the message from the body. So my job is to touch people. And in the touching, they feel themselves more. And because I, um, because a lot of what I do actually feels good, it invites people to feel themselves. The more they're willing to feel themselves, the more they're willing to feel their pain, the more their body gets the message of exactly what's wrong. So until the body really knows what's wrong, it doesn't know what to do. So when a person is just stifling pain, it confuses the, the healing process. Pain, we learned in massage school, and I, I, I was fascinated by this, um, there's the stages of healing. The first stage is pain. If you don't have the pain, the body doesn't know that there's anything wrong. And leprosy is a disease of the pain um, ner nerves. So a leper doesn't feel pain. Okay, they used to think that the leper was spontaneously breaking open. No, the leper was banging into things and, and hurting themselves all the time because they didn't feel pain. So without pain, you become a leper. <laughs> without the signal. Yeah. Okay, and so you don't know when to stop. So, you know, people come in and I say, so before you feel that pain, you probably feel an ache or you probably feel a tiredness or you feel something. You need, you, you are, you're not listening. When you get to that point, that's when you need to stop, not at the point where you can't stop because you, you can't go on because you're falling over in pain. So, I think the epidemic of pain has to do with all the messages that say, don't stop, you have to keep going, or you know, you're know, you weak if you're in pain. But it, think about all the messages, you're tired, have a candy bar, you're tired, have a cup of coffee, you're tired, get out and exercise. It's like, no, you're tired, go to sleep, you know? So, so I'm helping people come back to their body so that they listen to their body so that they stop whatever it is that they're doing because and I just heard on the radio the other day that 40 percent no I can't no I can't remember the exact numbers but a lot of doctors came to agree that for at least 40 percent of all ailments that people see their doctor about had a component of um, a, a behavioral component a behavioral component. So how we behave, and th these are doctors saying at least 40%. I'm saying 90% have a behavior, you know, it's like, you know, if something lands on you, you've had an accident, but you'll, you'll heal from that. If it becomes chronic, it's because you have a behavioral component, yes. right? Chronic pain, acute pain, you heal. If it becomes chronic, you are not healing. You're not healing because the signal to heal isn't reaching your brain, or you're doing something like that is um, chemically 
screwing your body up, mechanically screwing your body up, or, or you're panicking, which then creates bad behavior and bad chemistry. So there's, there's all of these things that you can do wrong if you're not guided. Right, so if I came to you, I just had an accident, and I come to you and I say I'm on Percocet, and Tylenol, and I'm in chronic pain, what would you tell me? I would say you need to stop the Percocet right away. I would give you a massage. Um, if you were on Percocet, you would probably be having intestinal problems. Okay, Percocet is like incredibly constipating. So I don't know where you'd, you know, where you'd be hurting, um, but if you're chronically constipated, it's going, and I, I start, when somebody comes, I start by massaging their abdomen because your organs are so important, right? So if somebody comes in with a shoulder, a neck, a lower back, a foot, it doesn't matter. I start on their belly. If their digestion isn't working properly, then they're not digesting their food and creating raw material for healing. Whenever you heal, there's raw material for healing. It comes from the food you eat, okay? If you came and you had just had a cup of coffee and a Danish for breakfast, I would say that's not good material for healing, okay? So I would discuss that with you. I mean, if you came and you were on Percocets, I would know that I needed to start from ground zero. You know nothing, really, about how to take care of yourself because you wouldn't be on Percocet if you did. You, you would never have made that choice. So, it's a, so my job becomes a job of educating. And it's very interesting when somebody comes and they're on Percocet and they're really frightened to feel their pain. Mostly that's what I find. And, um, you know, and I say, look, you know, if you have to take it to sleep, go for it. It's fine. But during the day, and I, I give people, you know, I, first of all, when they get a massage, they often just feel better because they are relax a little bit. Um, some people I can't get through to because they're really addicted to their coffee and their cigarettes and their sugar and their Percocets and their TV and their whatever else, you know, that, that becomes an addict. But if somebody comes and they've just been given that Percocet and they go, I don't like how this makes me feel, then I have a chance. If they like how it makes them feel, then it's difficult. Interesting. Right? So tell me a little about how your healing touch helps people heal and your process. Okay, so when I first got out of massage school, I thought I could fix people in a way. I mean, you know, they teach you effleurage and petrissage and and medical massage, and this is what you do for this, and if this muscle is tight, you massage it, da, da, da. Um, but over the years, I found out that, you know, it's nice, it's useful, but really what I'm doing is helping the person get in touch with themselves. And what I discovered over these years is that when somebody has a tight muscle, Every once in a while, like if I, had, I, I actually do rehabilitation for stroke patients, which is a whole other story. And those people really truly have contractures of a muscle and they really do need manual manipulation. But there's always a voluntary component. And whenever somebody, like somebody comes in and they go, I can't turn my neck, they're actually holding their neck muscles. Like they could move their neck if they would stop holding their neck muscles. And this is, it's, it's almost comical. Like when a person discovers that they're actually holding their own neck. And I say, look, you know, you ever see people who walk around like with a fist? They don't know they're doing that. It's voluntary muscle. Voluntary muscle only contracts, one, if it's got a neurological problem. If, if you've got like strychnine poisoning or, or you know, whatever that is, lockjaw or something, mm -hmm. or a signal from your brain, conscious part of your brain, or voluntary part of your brain, sending a signal, okay? 
but you can contract a muscle voluntarily and unconsciously. Okay? We do it all the time. We do it all the time. We posture. And our posture has to do with our defensiveness or suppressing some part of ourselves or guarding against a pain. Okay? Like somebody hurts their neck. You know, you ever twist your neck really fast and like you get, oh my God, my neck. And then, and if you go like this, the pain goes, starts to dissipate. But if you go like this, in a couple of days, you might need to come see me. Okay? And people do that all the time. You know? And you see it. You'll, if you watch people walking down the street, like, and you see people like this, and you think, oh, their backs are lazy. No, they're tight right here. Tight. Mm -hmm. That opens up. Then, then their body can go back to the normal position. Your skeleton actually wants to stand up straight. Your skeleton and your, and your ligaments actually would stand up straight with just a tiny bit of help. So you were just talking about uh, your boyfriend and his experience with pain right. and surgery. Right, that he, he had double hernia surgery. And I went to the pre-op with him to his doctor and his doctor said, well, we're, I'm going to give you Vicodin for the pain afterwards, um, but it's very constipating. And so you're really going to need to work on keeping your bowels moving because really the most painful thing you'll do is, is the most painful thing will be if you get constipated, it will be very hard to take a bowel movement, right? So I said, that makes no sense. Why do you give him pain medication that causes constipation if constipation is potentially the most painful thing after this post-surgical period? So... What did the doctor say? And he looked at me like I had two heads. You know, he just... It was sort of like... You know. So I did a little research and I know that um, the most important thing is ice as a first aid remedy and I went to the hospital with him and the nurse knew me it was so great and I said hey are you she was going to be his nurse I said can you get ice on him in the recovery room she said oh we don't usually do that and I said well can you and she said yes so she got ice on him before he would normally have gotten ice okay most of the time the biggest pain comes from swelling Okay? She got ice on him immediately, before he was even awake. So then, um, and he was, he was frightened about the pain. Crazy thing was, is the thing that hurt him most post-surgically was his neck. He had got a terrible neck pain. So I was like, okay, well, let me work on you. And what I discovered was that he had spasmed a psoas muscle, which is a muscle deep behind your organs. Makes perfect sense. He was knocked out. They cut into his body. Okay? But his body knew that and responded with a, with a tightening of his psoas muscle. When the psoas muscle tightens, the sternocleidomastoid almost always tightens also. Okay? So there he was with scar with uh, you know surgery and I very carefully went in and I his doctor would be apoplectic if he knew that I was giving him abdominal massage like within you know five hours of his coming home we relieved that psoas muscle got his neck to relax he had a little pain around the surgical area. I said, don't take that stuff. He took, I think he took a few Tylenols, like three or four Tylenols. He, I think we took a walk two days later. I, I can't even remember, he would know. We went down to the ice boats. He walked down on the ice. He took a half of a, of a Vicodin one night when I was sleeping because he had a panic attack essentially. He was afraid he was going to hurt. He really didn't hurt that bad. And he, he kind of had to prove to himself. And it was a half a one. It didn't make him constipated. He was fine. But it was really because his neck hurt. Tell me a little bit more about how you 
feel people's pain and from your on your hand. Okay, so a person is supposed to feel a certain way, supposed to, as in muscles should have a homogenous feel to them. There shouldn't be sunken places and then hard places. And so when I'm feeling a person and I get to a place where they're hard, I will, I will sort of challenge that area. And, and you had mentioned that you wanted to hear about the idea of fixing people. So it was, it used to be that I'd find that place and I'd go, oh, I want that to be soft. So I would try to soften it. And you know, that's nice, that, that actually often does soften it. It does actually bring a person's attention to it and then as it feels better, they, they will relax into it. But sometimes not. Sometimes their mind is stronger than they, they can, they've, they've lost their ability to feel themselves. So I say, I will say to them, hey, you're holding this muscle. Sometimes somebody comes in, I'm massaging their back and they've got their butt muscles clenched. And those are such big muscles. If you press on them, you're, and they're still holding them, it actually fatigues those muscles and then they have to let go. And you're just like, all of a sudden they let go and then they can feel that they have actually let go, like they've exhausted. But I don't want to exhaust people to make them let, the, let go. I want to raise their level of awareness of their body. If you're not aware that you're doing it, when you leave, you're gonna do it again, right? So I want, I want to, my job is to help inform them of what they're doing. So if they can, if, if you are going like this and you know it, you can let go. But if you're going like this and, and you've lost track that you've done, you're doing that, if I go, hey, here, look, you're holding, and you let it go, then you can leave. But if I just open it, open it, open it, open it, exhausted until it's like, oh, exhausted, it might not be useful to you. So is that clear, the difference between the, the two of me fixing it, making it open, making it relax, or getting a person's attention to the place where they feel it? Oh, I'm holding that. Oh. So dealing with pain is really acknowledging and then letting go. Yes, in a muscular way. Now, sometimes a person is in pain because, um, because their body is in an inflammatory condition, okay? And the inflammation, because if it's a tight muscle, they're pinching a nerve. If it's an inflammatory condition, then the inflammation of the body, there's nerves everywhere, right? It causes a, a, a hydraulic pressure on the nerves. So then you have to say, okay, why are you swollen? And you know, the immediate um, response of the body to pain is actually inflammation because inflammation brings the nutrients to the area and you know, if it's an infection, maybe white blood cells and you know, the immune system. So inflammation is actually important to the healing process too much inflammation can be detrimental because then it's stretching the tissues. So just the right amount of inflammation is what you want. But sometimes people are, have an inflammatory diet, okay? They're eating things that their body says, this is an emergency. You just put this stuff in me and this is poison. So your body has an immune response, a, a and an inflammatory response. Okay, you've heard of inflammatory yeah. foods, right? Yeah. So if a person is eating inflammatory foods all the time, uh, they have to stop that. <laughs> it's like if the injured area is already inflamed and then they're loading it with more inflammatory problems, I mean, smoking. How about narcotics, do you see? Well, the, and, well, you see, often they, they um, and so doctors see that the infl inflammation's a problem, and so then they give them anti-inflammatories. And an anti-inflammatory, if you haven't done proper first aid, c can be useful for a very short period of time. But 
it is not useful for chronic pain because it, it's just because there's something wrong, you need the inflammation there. You need just the right amount of inflammation. And those anti-inflammatories are non-discriminatory in terms of the inflammation. And then it's like if your body thinks it should be inflamed because something you've put in there is wrong, do you want to take the inflammation down and continue putting the wrong thing in? Or do you want to say, oh, this inflammation happens when I eat such and such? Or what happens if we wipe all this stuff out? We start with a clean diet. Does this inflammation go away? That's very useful information, right? So I will often ask people to experiment, you know, do a big experiment and eliminate all inflammatory foods. And sometimes it's phenomenal. I recently had somebody who's been getting massages for decades. Um, she has, you know, right, fibro, fibromyalgia, you know, which, as far as I'm concerned, is an autoimmune condition. I think I really, from everything that I've seen about it, it is that the immune system is going, something is very wrong here. We're, gonna, we're inflamed. She happens to be 100% Irish. I happen to know that the Irish are notoriously gluten intolerant. I said, you know, you should try giving up gluten, right? So she, she says, okay, you know, and the biggest problem for me is getting people to follow through with what I say, because I mean, to give up gluten in our society right now, it's just hard. It, you ask people to do hard things. So she, she wanted monthly massage, so she made another appointment. She came back, I said, how are you? She said, I am fabulous. I was like, really? You know, because I'm always surprised when people actually follow through. She said, I've done all the research. You're absolutely right. I stopped eating gluten. She said, I don't hurt. Okay, so this is a woman who is trying to do the right thing. She was eating a lot of good food. But for her system, that was wrong. And you can't massage that away. Okay, the, the chemistry of the body is, has to be done. And in Chinese medicine, diet is first. Okay, if you're not giving your body the correct ingredients for healing, no matter what anybody does, it's not gonna help. Second thing they do is massage, because massage doesn't have much in the way of um, negative side effects. So massage is about helping a person feel themselves so that the messages that their body is giving them can be, um, heated, right? So, so pain is the messenger, um, or discomfort, or just ill ease, like all the different reasons why tension. Um, that's telling a person something, and, and allowing that message to come through. How do, you, how do you hear your body? How do you allow the message that comes to actually speak to you and move you to change what you're doing. And, um, you know, I do that. Like, like on a regular basis, people go, oh, I didn't, I didn't feel, I didn't know that. People come in and they don't even know every place they're hurting. I'll be massaging them and go, I didn't know I hurt there. And I'll go, yeah, you're holding that really tight. And then I'll, they'll come back and they'll go, oh yeah, you know, I can breathe. That's why I always start with the abdomen, because then they can breathe again. And when you breathe, it's like life, you know, oxygen is so important. Um, but I'm not sure that that encapsulates everything. But the solution is really to hear the body and acknowledge the body. To, to feel it, to hear it. Yes, to, um, to not reject the signals that are coming in, but to, but to, to welcome on some level, welcome your pain that, that it is keeping you from doing something that would move you even further in the wrong direction. Sometimes someone comes in and they've had an accident and it's terrible. And I say, this is such a blessing because you are so on the wrong track in your life. And they heal from 
whatever the acute injury is, but they heal from all of the things that they were doing wrong to begin with. Pain is, pain is a blessing in disguise. How's that? That is really true. You know, every time, if you don't have your pain, you don't, you don't have, I mean, right? The hand on the stove, ow, otherwise you would burn your hand up. It's no different when the pain is somewhere that you can't see it. It still needs to heal. And, and how that healing takes place, everyone has a different story. They're fascinating stories. I mean, I could sit here, I could sit here for days telling you stories. 